Amen. All right. This morning is going to begin an unofficial series. It's not going to be every single week. Uh, that's why it's unofficial. But I'm going to be preaching on foundational doctrines that we believe here. So I've preached, you know, many different types of sermons. Obviously, the church has been around, you know, for you know almost a year and a half now, and varying degrees of spiritual understanding. Some of the deep things of God, some things simple, you know. But I wish one thing that I wish I would have done is started off in the very beginning and just preached basically what we believe on foundational doctrines, just core essential. essential teachings of the faith of what we stand for. As I mentioned in a couple of, uh, uh, a couple of Sunday morning ago sermon about laying again, not laying again the foundation, I talked about the importance of having the right foundation. Now everything is built upon that foundation. So you must first have the right foundation. That is extremely important. So I'm going to be preaching a couple of sermons here a few sermons, I'm not sure exactly how many, over the course of the next month, two months. Uh, it, it will be spotty, it will be unofficial, but I will announce it when I'm doing so on just foundational teachings of what we believe. Now, last week, this I'm spider webbing about three things together. Last week I preached on the subject of calling upon the name of the Lord or the sinner's prayer. That is foundational. That is something that's very foundational. That is what we believe that strongly. That is what we practice. We believe and practice the sinner's prayer. Not on a daily basis like I'm getting resaved, right? But when we go out soul winning, we lead people in the sinner's prayer. We believe that that is biblical, right? So, you know, I'm going to be this morning teaching also again on salvation. The title of the sermon is Salvation is Not a Process. Salvation is Not a Process. So this is an angle or this is an aspect of salvation that's very important. In all of salvation, the gospel is such a perfect, pure message. And it is very simple just, you know, just to receive it and understand it. But when you start studying it, there are different doctrines that tie together. And there's a level of complexity, just like in all things in the Bible that you can find in God's Word. You can always keep studying and it's just, you know, this deep treasure trove of knowledge you can continually get into. And this ties in with every other aspect of salvation. That's important to understand. Salvation is not a process. Salvation is immediate and salvation is instantaneous. It happens like that. I want you to look with me here at 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. Look with me at verse number 1. It says this, We then as workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. That's obviously, you know, speaking on behalf of their salvation. You receive not the grace of God in vain. You receive the grace of God. Now, now do something because he's given you grace. You know, show grace to others. Preach the gospel, right? Look at verse number two. I want to focus on that. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted. So he's talking about their salvation, speaking about that specifically. He says this, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the time. Now is the accepted time. I'm sorry. Behold, now is the accepted time. And then he says this. Behold, now is the day of salvation. I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians chapter number 2. Now, if you've noticed there, it said this. It ended verse number 2 with now is the day of salvation. There are many people that believe that salvation is a process. The majority of churches teach in some way. Just churches that would say, hey, we're Christian, right? That would fall under the umbrella of what you know, most people in America would say Christian or just labeled Christian or call themselves Christian. If you asked them or you went to their church, they would preach to you a message of salvation that would be a process. When you knock on doors all the time, I, you know, everyone that's going to go out soul winning today, the majority of people that you're going to speak to are going to believe that salvation is a process. They're going to think in some way or another that salvation is a process, that it's not something that happens immediate, that it's something that happens over a period of time. Yay, some people think that it's over a lifetime. You know, maybe it takes an entire life to obtain salvation. You never really know when you have salvation. They just believe in some way or another that it is a process. The Bible teaches that salvation happens in a day. The Bible teaches that salvation happens in a moment. The Bible says, behold, now is the day of salvation. There is a day when you got saved. Right. There was a moment when you got saved. There was a second when you decided right then and there, I'm putting my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and you were saved. It was not a process. It was immediate. It was instantaneous. Amen. Salvation is immediate. Now the first point that I want to focus on is the fact that the Bible teaches that those that are God's children, those that are the children of God or are saved, that they 
are saved past tense, as I just said, are saved. That they are not being saved, that there's not a process of salvation. That there was a day in which those people were saved, and you can look back and you can say, hey, I am saved, or I was saved at this day. You know, and obviously you would still be saved. You are saved is what the Bible teaches, that it is past tense. It's the reason why we put a D on the end of it. You know, people just blow over that. People even that believe that salvation is a process will use the word saved. Past tense, they will say that they are saved, and then you dig a little deeper, and they don't understand what that really means. They're using that word, but they're saying like, yeah, well, I'm working on it, you know, but they just said two seconds ago that they are saved. The word saved means that you have been delivered from danger. That's what it means. It's past tense. It means that there is no longer any danger. You know, if you were saved from a house fire, you're not continually being saved from that house fire, right? If you maybe you had to get out of a house fire, you're not, it's not this continual process. If you say, hey, I was saved from that fire, that's past. There is no fear of that, of that fire. There is no fear of, there's no danger of you, you know, going to the end of that fire any longer. So when we say, hey, I am saved from hell. I am saved you know, from my sins. It's past tense. It's already done. Because that day is past. The day of salvation is past. And you can look back and now you can say, hey, I am saved today. It's already done. It's already finished. The Bible uses this language repeatedly. Very famous verse. I want to begin with that. Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 8. It says this, For by grace ye are saved. Notice that. Or I'm sorry, for by grace are ye saved. For by grace are ye saved. Right? For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. God. I was quoting, I looked up, it's verse 5 is what I was quoting. They say it backwards if you look at verse 5. So notice there, for by grace are ye saved. It's past tense. It's, it's already occurred. It's already taken place. Go with me to Acts chapter number 2, verse number 47. Acts chapter number 2, verse number 47. Acts chapter number 2, verse number 47. Acts chapter number 2, verse number 47 says this, Praising God and having favor with all the people. And then it says this, And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So notice that something takes place before they're added to the church. What is that? When they're being, when they're being inducted into the church or attending the church, what's taking place? First they are saved. Such as should be saved are added to the church. So salvation is there. It's already finished. It's past tense. There was a day of their salvation. And then guess what they do? Then they start coming to church. Then they're in attendance at church. Acts 4.12 Go to Acts chapter number 4, verse number 12. We're going to look at a few of these where it is, it is that we are saved. It is past tense. It's speaking about it in the past. Acts chapter number 4, verse number 12 says this, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Go to uh, Romans chapter number 8, verse number 24. This is a really good one. Romans chapter number 8, verse number 24. Romans chapter number 8, verse number 24 says this, For we are saved by hope. Notice that. For we are saved by hope. Past tense, right? But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, what doth he yet hope for? Uh, 2 Timothy chapter number 1, verse number 9. I want you to go to 2 Timothy chapter number 1, verse number 9. Look at a few of these. You got one more after this. 2 Timothy chapter number 1, Verse number 9, I'll read to you from Titus chapter number 3, verse number 5. The Bible says this, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. Now notice that, that the works, if they would have done them, were what? In past tense. Do you notice that? Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but then he goes on to say this, But according to His mercy He saved us. That's past tense. You're there in 2 Timothy chapter number 1, verse number 9. 2 Timothy chapter number 1, verse number 9 says this, Who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us. Notice that's past tense, all of this. Given us in Christ Jesus <clears throat> before the world 
began. So he says, who hath saved us? See, they can sit there and they can speak about their salvation. Paul can write to Timothy and he can say to Timothy that God saved us. Who hath saved us, speaking about God. That means it is past tense. It is already finished. They can rejoice in their salvation. They can be grateful. That's what he's doing. He's thanking God. He's being grateful and he's praising God for the salvation that he has already obtained and that it is done. There was a day of Paul's salvation. There was a day of Timothy's salvation. And then he can write to Timothy and say, Who hath saved us? Why does it matter? Why is this wording so important? Well, go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse number 18. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse number 18. Because the majority, their understanding of salvation, the majority that is, that would say that they're Christian, is that they are being saved is that there is a process, is that there's a period of time where their salvation is taking place, right? They would, they would, they may, some people may use the words and say, hey, I'm saved, but when you dig deep and you speak to them and you get inside of their heart, they're going to start telling you that they believe that they're being saved, that they believe that it's a process. They, they'll say this, that it's not yet complete. Saved means that it's finished, right? Saved means that it's done. I, it's already in the past Completely 100% saved. Look in your King James Version here. This is a, an example of why we are King James only and why we will only use the King James Bible. Amen. And the only time anyone will ever use an NIV or, or, or read a verse from the NIV is to ridicule it and to mock it and to prove that it's not God's Word. Any, anybody wants to come to the preaching class and use an NIV, that's perfectly fine as long as you're criticizing it. That's a critical text. If you want to take it and, and show all the problems with it, like I'm going to do right now, that's perfectly fine. We are, we are staunchly King James only and will always be 100%. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse number 18 in the King James Version. The Bible says this, For the preaching of the cross, it's the gospel of course, is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. So notice that, unto us which are saved right now, I am saved. That means that there was a day in which I was saved. It's already finished, right? And I could still say today, I am saved. It is the power of God. Now I'm going to read to you from the NIV, the New International Version, the, from 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse number 18. You say, oh, this doesn't matter. Okay, well, 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse number 18, in the New International Version says this. For the message of the cross is foolishness, to them, to those, I'm sorry, who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now notice what they said there. But to us who are being saved. Now if you read the NIV and you get to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse number 18, doctrinally, what is that verse going to teach you? It's going to teach you that salvation is a process. That there is a time in which you are being saved. That this would be Paul saying and teaching that he is being saved as well. You ever think that? Because he said us. In this verse it says in, in, in the NIV it says those who are, I'm sorry here, those who are being saved. So you could, you know, I, I thought that it said us there. But let's say this. Those who are just referring to the group of people, just salvation in general... They are, he's teaching, Paul would be teaching that there are people that are being saved. Those that are saved, they are being saved. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 2, verse number 15. See the consistency in the King James Version, teaching the right doctrine when it comes to salvation, it being immediate, it being instantaneous, taking place like that, it jiving with 2 Corinthians chapter number 6 when the Bible says that there is a day of salvation. See the consistency of that, but then look here again. Well, I'm going to read to you in the NIV from 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15. From the NIV, it says this. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. So notice again, those who are being saved. So it's teaching again that salvation is a process. That those that, those that are you know, uh, going to be saved, that they got there through a process of being saved. That there was a time in which they were being saved. 2 Corinthians chapter number 2, verse number 15, in the Bible, the real Bible, it says this, For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. I like that better than aroma anyways. 
in them that are saved and in them that perish. So notice that. In them that are saved. It's past tense. It's 100% finished. It's complete. And those people are saved today. Every person that he's, that he's speaking about, about the saved, they can look back and say, hey, there was a day of my salvation. And today I am saved. It's over. It's done. It's instantaneous. It's immediate. That's why. I want you to go to John chapter number 5, verse number 24. This is the most powerful verse. If anyone ever tries to tell you that salvation is a process, turn them to John chapter number 5, verse number 24. John chapter number 5, verse number 24. It ends the argument immediately. It is case closed. John chapter number 5 Verse number 24 says this, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Now notice there that he said this. This is, you want to know the process of salvation? This is what it is. Number one, hearing the word of God. And then number two, believing on the word. Now, as far as your process, there's only one condition. Notice, that's super important. As far as the process on your end, there's only one thing that you have to do. You have to put your trust in the Word of God. You have to put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is all that needs to be done in order to be saved. And he says that if you believe on Him, you believe on Him that sent me, he says this, hath everlasting life. That's present tense. That's like saying has, right? The T-H is like modern day vernacular of an S. So you would be saying, has everlasting life. And then it goes on to say this, and shall not come into condemnation. Saying in the future, you're not going to be condemned. You're not going to come into condemnation. Obviously, talking about hell. You're not going to be condemned. You know, you're not going to come into condemnation. And then he goes on and he says this. Why? But is, present tense, notice that. But is, right then, right there, when you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you believe on the words that he speaks. It says, but is passed from death unto life. This verse right here just blows salvation being by a process out of the water. It tells you that salvation takes place in a moment, and it tells you at that moment that when you believe, it says, but is passed from death unto life. Amen. So that's super important to understand because the reason why, this is point number two, the reason why people believe that salvation is a process is because they believe in more than one condition. Did you understand what I said? The reason why, if you dig deep on those that say, hey, I believe that salvation takes place over a period of time, or I believe that someone is being saved over their lifetime, it's because they believe in a multiplicity of requirements in order to be saved. But when you understand that salvation has one condition, it makes perfect sense on why it would be instantaneous. Because at the very moment, that one moment when you, when you fulfill that one requirement, you are passed from death unto life. That's why it's instantaneous. At the moment when you hear His word and then you decide to trust and obey the gospel, you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, at that moment there's only one requirement, you fulfill it, you are passed from death unto life. Amen. That is the day of salvation. That is the moment of salvation. And then every day going forward after that, you can look back you can say, hey, I am saved. That was the day when I was saved. It's past tense. It didn't take place today. I'm not in the midst of it. I'm not like it's step three of seven. We're in the middle of the, you know, I'm 50% there. You can say, hey, I was saved at this day. Amen. This is when I was saved. And this was the day of my salvation. There was a day, there was a moment when I heard the gospel and I put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I was saved right then and there. Notice, is passed from death unto life. If anyone ever tries to say, hey, salvation's a process, show them John chapter number 5, verse number 24. There's no way around it. It takes place like that. At the moment of what? Believe. At that moment, you, you are, it says he is, using present tense language specifically, he says, is passed from death unto life. Salvation is instantaneous. Salvation is immediate. It happens just like that. It's not a process at all because there's only one condition. That's why people are so screwed up on this. It's because they think that there are multiple conditions of salvation, but there is in fact only one condition. I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter number 2, verse number 21. See how uh, you know, all of these different understandings come into play with one another. Knowing the conditions and, and, and what you believe as far as uh, 
what you have to do or fulfill to get to heaven is going to decide whether or not you believe that salvation is instantaneous or whether you think that it's a process. The reason why we understand and know that it is immediate is because we understand and know that there's only one requirement, that there is only one condition in order to be saved. We'll look at this, some familiar verses with you. I'm sure look at Acts chapter number 2, verse number 21. It says this, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Go to Acts chapter number 60, verse number 30. We know that that calling upon the name of the Lord happens through faith. The faith and the trust that they put in the Lord Jesus Christ when asking Him to save them is the moment of salvation. It's the faith and belief in their heart that saves them. Look at Acts chapter number 16, verse number 30. So you notice the, the, there's a condition given here. It's one condition and they are saved right then and there at that moment. You know what's happening? They are being passed from death unto life. That's what's taking place. Look at Acts 16.30. It says, And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Verse 31. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That one condition. And then he says this. And thou shalt be saved. So notice. There's only one condition, and when you do it, once you fulfill it, once you, you, know, you have fulfilled the one requirement, you are passed from death unto life. You are saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. You know, isn't that great that you can look at your salvation and just say, hey, I am saved. Think about that. That I had, There was a day when I was saved. And you know what? It was easy. It was simple. There's only one thing that I had to do. It's great that you can go out because you've received grace, right? You can go out and you can share that grace with other people and explain to them, hey, you know, I've been saved. It's past tense. I have nothing to worry about. I've been, you know, uh, delivered from the danger of ever going to hell. Let me tell you how easy it is and how it can happen in a moment. It can happen instantaneous. I can't tell you how many times I've told people that. You can be saved right now. That's what it says, I believe, on our invitation in the back. You know, you can be saved right now. Why? Because there is a day of salvation. It happens in a moment. It's instantaneous. Look at with me. Go to Romans chapter number 10, verse number 9. Romans chapter number 10, verse number 9. As I said, this is kind of spider webbing together with... The past few weeks, this is very foundational, and I wanted to build off of the sermon about calling upon the name of the Lord and how that is the moment of salvation. It is the faith when calling upon His name and asking Him to save you that you are saved, and it is that very moment when you do so. Romans chapter number 10, verse number 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Those two things are happening concurrently, both at the, at the same time. I didn't point this out, but further, further to prove that, look at verse number 8, it says, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. It's saying that while you're speaking it, it's in your heart as well. When you're saying it, when it's coming out of your mouth, when you're sitting there and preaching the word of faith, it's in your heart and it's in your mouth at the same time. It's the same thing when you call upon the name of the Lord. The faith is in your heart and then you're speaking the words in your mouth. You notice that, that these things are happening concurrently or simultaneously and it's all summarized with, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Look at, uh, yeah, look at Romans 10, 13. We'll look at that and read it so you can have your eyes on it. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Um, Luke chapter number 8, verse number 12, I'll read to you. You can go ahead and turn to John chapter number 3. John chapter number 3. Luke chapter 8, verse 12 says this. Those by the wayside are they, they that hear, then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts lest they should believe and be saved. Notice that. What would happen? They would believe and then they would be saved. No more fear of ever going to hell. That's it. Just one, the one thing you have to do. Believe and be saved. The Bible also teaches, and this is something you never hear um, <clears throat> Catholics ever talk about. Actually, Catholics despise this term. My wife you know, when, when, uh, before we ever moved to Arizona, you know, my church was filled with a bunch of Ruckmanites. And they had all these magnets. And my family, a lot of them, uh, you know, were Ruckmanites. And they gave us some magnets, all right? We had them on the back of our car. And one of them was John chapter number 3. I believe it's verse 7. It's just the statement, you must be born again. And uh, somebody approached my wife and asked my wife, and the person was Catholic, and asked my wife, like, are you one of those born-againers? 
And my wife talked to her for a little while, and then the, one, the person, I don't remember if it was a man or woman, but they ended up being a Catholic. And, and that statement alone shows like that, that this person despises that. You can tell that they're, they are degrading. They are criticizing that statement. Like, are you one of those born-againers, right? Like, mocking it. It's meant to be derogatory, like a pejorative term, right? They're meant to make fun of you. You're a born-againer? Does it sound like they, they wanted to be something positive? Of course not. You're a born again or no. They're trying to make fun of it, but guess what? It's biblical. It, it, it's, it's something that the Bible clearly teaches, and yes, I'm a born againer. Right. I've been born again. I've been saved. Amen. Past tense. That's why they don't understand this, is because they believe that salvation is a process. That being born again does not jive with salvation being a process. It sounds ridiculous. Yeah, I'm being born again. I'm in this slow process of being born, right? There's God all or Jesus while walking this earth, he used a lot of different analogies, right? He had he had different analogies that he would use. And we're going to look at a few of them right now. And one of them is being born again. He likens the moment of salvation, the moment of when you are saved and you are delivered and pa being passed from death unto life. He likens that unto being born again. Now, when you were born physically, you have a birth certificate. And there is an exact time that they wrote down. So, you know, I don't know if they, you know, they, they record seconds often. Maybe sometimes that they do that. But they do not. So, but they could. There, there would be a, 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 a literal second when you come out of there, right? There could be, hey, we just saw the head, right? right? Write it down, write it down. There's a time in which a person is born, right? There is a moment in which a person is born. It's not this big, drawn-out, long process, right, of when, when a person is born. So when you look at this analogy that's being used, there's a reason why it's being used. Because there is a day of your birth, physically, and like the Bible teaches, and as we started out with, there is a day of salvation. There is a day of salvation. There's a time when you are passed from death, unto life, right? There's a moment. Well, there's also a moment in which you were born. Look at John chapter number 3, verse number 1. It says this, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So he doesn't even want to talk about what Nicodemus said to him. He just goes straight into the most important thing. Hey, Nicodemus, you need to be saved. And what does he say? He says, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So he's saying you, you need to be born again. You need to have another birth, right? And then... Nicodemus, of course, in his natural mind, he's an unsaved man. That's why, of course, Christ is telling him that he needs to be saved. Verse 4, he says this, Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? I mean, obviously, that's a ridiculous you know, response. You know, he, he can't understand it. He's, he doesn't know what he's saying. So he's saying, How am I going to be born again? You know, I'm sure he wants to see the kingdom of God, and he's thinking, how is this possible? Can I enter again into my mother's womb and be born, right? And then it says in verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So he explains that second verse. So of course, there in verse number 5, Jesus is elaborating on what Nicodemus did not understand. We saw there that Nicodemus responds with, Can a man enter again in his, in his mother's womb and be born? So, of course, you need to be born again. That means you had a first birth. That means what Jesus is referring to is there is a first birth there somewhere, which is, of course, the physical birth. And that's the only birth that Nicodemus understands. So he equates the second birth also with the first birth. He just thinks, well, that birth needs to take place twice. And now Nicodemus, or Jesus responds and says, no, 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 they're not the same birth. He responds and he explains the first birth is what? 
of the water. He says this, verse 5, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water. And then he says this, here's the second birth. Here's the being born again. And then he says, and of the Spirit. So he explains you need to also be born of the Spirit. You have that first birth, but you don't go back and have that same type of birth, birth again. You need to be born of the water, but then there also needs to be the second birth of the Spirit. A totally different type of birth. So he says, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And this continues. He's not finished speaking about this. Look at verse number 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. So that water birth was what? It was the flesh. I mean, it's as clear as day. He's now restating the same thing. And the way to prove that is this. Look at the next part. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Process of elimination. You have two things here. Line them up. Water and spirit. And then you have uh, flesh and spirit. Well, obviously, spirit and spirit go together. So what goes together over here? Water and flesh, right? And, of course, you know, uh, uh, when a baby is born, what happens? What takes place? The water breaks, right? That is I, what makes the most sense that Jesus is referring to here. Uh, even in, you could even do this in 1 John chapter number 5, and even at the moment that Jesus dies, which is what 1 John 5 is talking about, it says that out of his side came forth water and blood. And the purpose of that is it's speaking about him being a man. If you look in the context of 1 John 5, that is the purpose of that. It's saying that, hey, you know, the Spirit, the Spirit bears record, you know, that Christ came in the flesh. That's the whole context of 1 John 5 and what's taking place there. So that water, even in 1 John 5 and John 19, when Jesus has the Spirit going to his side, that is a reference to his flesh even at that moment. So what's the point here? The water lines up with the flesh, right? And then over here you have the spirit and the spirit. You must be born again. You have the water flesh birth, but guess what else you need? You need the spiritual birth. You need the spiritual birth. And then he says in verse number 7, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. So notice the analogy that he uses. Does it jive with 2 Corinthians 6? Perfectly. The day of salvation. Your, your water and flesh birth took place in a day, took place in a moment, and there was a time that was written down. If you still have your birth certificate, you can go to it, you can look at it, and there was a moment in which you were born. Well, guess what? You have a spiritual birth certificate too. That's why Christ likens those births together because salvation, just like your physical birth, also takes place in a moment. You are born again at the moment that you call upon the name of the Lord, right? I want you to now go with me to, uh, go to Ephesians chapter number 1, verse number 13. I'm going to read to you from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, speaking again about, about being born again on that subject. It says this, Seeing ye have purified your souls. So notice that's past tense. Purified, past tense, your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, seeing that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again. Saying that he's speaking about you now because you are you are born again. Being born again, you should be doing this. That's what it means when it says being there. It's it's a present participle in the 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 sense of the fact that you are born again. And then it says, Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. We are saved by being born again. Uh, Ephesians chapter number 1 verse number 13. I need to get there myself. I'm going to read to you from John chapter number 3 verse number 13. Here's the other point that I want to make to you is that you are saved in a moment and you are saved by one condition. That is why you can be saved in a moment. So therefore looking back at that moment there was a moment in which you fulfilled that condition. Therefore, that moment was past tense. John chapter number 3, verse number 18 says this, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, then it says this, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And we notice what that says. That's super important. Why is the man that's going to hell in this situation, he gives you an example of two people. A man that believed and a man that, what does it say, hath not believed. So he looks at two people, one is saved, one is not condemned, and one is. Now what's condemning the man that is going to hell, that is condemned? What is it? It's the fact that he hath not believed. Now what this does is a couple of things for us. Number one, we can understand that it's not this continual process of faith. 
Some people will try to teach that. That it's just like you got to keep the faith, brother. If you have, this is what free will Baptists supposedly teach. And when you dig, dig deeper on them too, I've spoken to them, that is not true. They're liars. They believe that salvation is by works. It ultimately always goes back to that. But they believe supposedly on paper in their doctrinal statement that it is this continual belief. That you have to keep the faith. It's only faith that saves you. It's only you know, your trust in God that saves you. But you have to keep the faith. You know, you have to make sure that you have the faith all the way to the end or you'll go to hell. Now this debunks that. Because it tells you, hey, there's a man that's condemned, there's a man that's not condemned, therefore he's saved. And you know why this guy's going to hell? Because he hath not believed. It doesn't say because he's not believing. It says because he hath not believed. Further supporting that there was a moment when he was saved. And that makes perfect sense because if there's one condition that you must fulfill, and it is believing, and once you do that, you are saved, well, what also did you do in order to be saved? Believed. Past tense. So there was a moment in which you were saved because there was a moment in which that you fulfilled that condition. So that, that moment is past tense. Saved and believed, right? So we can see that that is a past tense moment. That's why it is instantaneous. A moment that you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. This also ties in with last week's sermon because it's not just the faith in God. It's not just how much faith you have, right? right? It's, it's specifically talking about the moment where you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ to save you. Where you put your faith in Christ. Ephesians chapter number 1 verse number 13. See this again. It says this. In whom ye also trusted. Now is that present tense? That's past tense, isn't it? It's not a present, you know, a continual participle or, or, or verb in this case, is it? No. It is a past tense verb. It's trusted in the past tense. It's complete. It's finished. It's perfected. In whom ye also trusted. Watch this. After that ye heard the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed. Notice, past tense again. It restates the same thing. We get the definition of believe. What is it? It's trust. And notice it's not like in whom ye are trusting while you're being saved. No, it's, it's trusted. It's believed. Past tense, because there was a day of your salvation. Because there was a moment when you were born again. Because there was a moment in which you heard the word and then you trusted and you believed the word. Notice how we've seen this repeatedly. Remember in the, uh, I, I read you just a moment ago in Luke 8, 12. It says, those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh, then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. So notice what? what the very first thing that takes place is. Hearing the word. And then what is the response? Believing and then being saved, right? So the part on, on your part, the, the requirement on your part is just believing. It's just trusting. So first step is hearing. What, is, what do you need to do now? Now that you've heard the word of God, you just believe it. That's exactly what Romans 10 teaches. You know, how shall they hear without a preacher? Not only that, that's exactly what John 5, 24 teaches. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me. So it's the believing and then the trusting. What does it say here? Same thing. After that ye heard the word of truth. So there's the hearing of the word of truth. Now you, now you have heard the gospel and there needs to be a moment where you respond to it and do what? And choose to trust Christ. Put your faith in him. And at that moment you are, if you do so, you are passed from death unto life. Notice also, I want to I point this out. This is another point. Teaching that salvation is instantaneous. It's immediate. It says in verse 13, at the very end, it says this, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Is that past, present? What is that? That's, that's past tense. It says that ye were sealed, were, past tense, sealed, past tense, with that Holy Spirit of promise. When did it take place? When you trusted. That's also being used. I want you to notice this. That's also telling you that that took place at the same moment. Do you notice that? It says again, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, after that ye believed, were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You know what happened? 
You heard the word of truth, you trusted, you believed, and at that moment, you know what happened? You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Notice all the past tense. Why? Because this is the moment you're born again. This is the moment of salvation. This is everything that takes place right at that one split second, that one split moment, the day of salvation when you get saved. That's why it's past tense. Sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now, something sealed is not opened. It, it, it cannot be opened. That's the purpose of putting a seal on something is so that it is not open until a particular time. Like when you can, you know, uh, uh, foods and stuff. You know, I had a, uh, my aunt that lived close to me, my great aunt that lived close to me when I was younger, and they had a functioning operating farm, and I would go down there and like string, I don't know if any, any of you guys have ever done that, but we would string green beans. Like where she, they, somebody went out there and ripped them all off the crop and brought them in, and she would have two buckets, and they were like, you know, like the pale buckets, and we would have one big bucket f full of like the raw beans, the green beans, that were just literally, all they did was pulled it right off the plant. And you would reach in there and grab them, and there, you know, it's just, it looks, you know, obviously, I, I, I couldn't explain it to you. It's got a string in it, and you want to crack it open. So you take the string and rip it apart, and then you bust it in half, and then we'd toss them inside the other pail. I would help her doing that. Now, after we would do that, she's not going to just eat this huge, big bucket of green beans like, hey, it's dinner time, right? Those need to be preserved or they'll go bad. So what she would do is she would go through a process of canning them. She had all these mason jars, and she, I didn't help her do that, but she'd go in there and she'd do the mason jars, and they have a, a particular type of lid, and there's a, a way to know whether or not it's sealed, and you can test it and look at it, and she would seal those until a particular time, until the time in which she was, they were ready to use them, right? And then at that time, what would she do? She would break the seal. But before that, before that, exact moment in which she was going to use them, that seal is, that's the purpose of the seal, is that it's not opened. It will not be open until then. Notice it says here, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Look at verse number 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance. That's the Holy Spirit is the earnest, or like the down payment of our inheritance, that we're going to receive this inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. Go to Ephesians 4.30. We get more information on this. It says this in Ephesians chapter number 4, verse number 30. It says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby, so by the Holy Spirit, ye are sealed. Ye are sealed. So notice it's already taken place. And they're still sealed to this day. Ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So when is that seal going to be opened? No man can pluck you out of his hand. There's nobody that can break that seal. He has a time in which he's going to open that seal. And when is it? It's, it tells you the day of redemption. The day of redemption. This takes place in a moment. It's past tense. You are sealed today because it already, it already took place. When? When you believed when you trusted Christ. Now lastly, I want to go look at the, these last analogies here. I want you to go to John chapter number 10, verse number 9. As I mentioned, Christ will use analogies. And there's, you can tell that with each of the analogies that there's a purpose in what you're trying to pick out. Now when someone in conversation with you uses an analogy for something, you can, there's a certain a point that they're trying to get across based upon this analogy. And once you understand you know, uh, uh, the analogy and, and why it was made, you can see the purpose and why it was chosen out, right? Because you can choose any type of analogy. So what you do is you're trying to get a particular point across about something. So you choose something that is analogous. The word analogous or an analogy means similar, right? So you choose something that is analogous so you can get that particular point across and then you use that as an analogy. Well, you want to know something that all of the analogies of Christ have in common? All of them? They're all easy and they're all a one-step process that just happens in a moment. It just happens in a moment and there's only one step to them. <clears throat> John chapter number 4 verse number 13 says this. So you're in John 10 uh, verse number 9. We're going to read that in just a moment. Uh, and we'll end there. John 4.13 says this. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting 
life. Now, I want you to notice the analogy that he made. Now, this analogy is meant to actually contrast. He, he draws an analogy in order to say that these two things are not alike in this way. He says this, hey, first, what they do have in common is we'll consider them wells of water, right? This is a well of physical water. This is a well of spiritual water. And he says, if someone comes to this physical water and drinks of it, now, how many drinks would they be taking? One. Because he says this afterwards. They're going to thirst again. Notice that. So he's not saying that you're repeatedly drinking of it. Then the point of thirsting again makes zero sense. That Of course you're going to thirst again. or You wouldn't thirst again if you're going to keep drinking of it. He's talking about the only way that that makes sense is if you're taking one drink of it. You notice that? Then he, goes, he speaks about the spiritual water and he makes this statement. He says, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The only way that that makes sense is that you drink of his water one time. In his analogy, what he's saying is, hey, take a drink of this water, one, and you're going to thirst again. But take a drink of my water, one, you'll never thirst again. You notice that? The whole point of it is that you're taking one drink. If you had to keep going back and drinking of the spiritual well and keep getting resaved, or it's a process and you have to keep doing it over and over again, then it's exactly like the other water. It's no different than the physical well. So the whole point is, hey, we have the two wells here. Drink of this one, take a drink of it. That's one time, not drinking of it, not a continual uh, you know, uh, taking place. If you drink of this, one drink, you're going to thirst again. But if you drink of this, one drink, and that's why he says drinks, whosoever drinks of this water. So if you take a drink of it, you're never going to thirst again. That's the spiritual well. So notice how he likens it unto doing what? One time. One time occurrence, something easy, something that what? Takes place in a moment. Just like being born again. The day of salvation. And then it's past tense. It's over at that moment. It's not gonna, you're not going to have to go back and, and, and continually do something in order to, to maintain your salvation. It's done. You are passed from death unto life. I want you to look there at John chapter number 10, verse number 9. Jesus says this, and this is where we're going to end. He says this, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. And then he says this, and shall go in and out and find pasture. Now, think about that. So, he says this, I am the door. So, Jesus Christ is representing the door. What was over and over again, you know, uh, not the first step of salvation on your part, because we realize that there's only one thing that we have to do, one condition. But in order for you to fulfill that one condition, what first has to happen? You have to hear the Word of God. Remember that over and over again. In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth. So you have to hear the word of God first. That's you standing at the door. That's you there and you've heard it and you now you can make the option of whether or not. You can make the choice between your options. You can, you can, you can opt out or you can say, hey, I'm going to trust this. I'm going to believe this. Right? And, the, and Jesus here likens himself unto being a door. And he says, I am the door, by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. You notice that? He shall be saved, past tense. Now, hearing the word is standing before the door. You now have the option. And how many steps, if you're standing in front of the door, does it take to get through the door? One step. There's only one step. You have the option, you have the choice, you're standing there. And all you have to do is just take one step from one side of the door to the other side of the door. Because there's only one condition, there's only one requirement in order to fulfill what needs to be fulfilled for salvation. And there, listen, think about this. There's a moment when you step through that door, that's you being passed from death unto life. You're on one side of the door and that's you condemned. You do the one thing, you believe, you step, you take the one step through the door, and guess what? Now, you're no longer condemned. You're saved. You know how it happens? Just like that. Think of being born again. Think of 
comparing it unto birth, right? It's your past from death unto life. You're here and then it happens in a moment. Today is the day of salvation. Every analogy that Christ uses is something that happens immediately. It's one drink. How long does it take to take a drink of something? A moment. moment. Talks about liking it unto eating a piece of bread. He just says, whosoever, you know, he, talk, he said uh, uh, something along the lines of, of, of just, he makes the statement of just eating the bread, right? He says, he is the bread of life. If any man eats of this bread, right? So it's just saying, taking a bite of it, that's it. Taking a drink, it's one drink. Being born again, it's just, just like your birth, there's a moment when you were born. There's a day of salvation. There's a moment when you're passed from death unto life. All of this fits together with it being one condition. That there's only one requirement. And it's all concluded with that concept of it's this door, you hear the word, and you make the choice. It's not seven steps, right? The door is way over there, and like the Church of Christ teaches, there's seven steps of salvation. You do these things, and then you finally get through the door. Now you've passed from death unto life. It's stupid. It doesn't even make sense. You know, you drink of the water. You just take a drink of it. And it's a gift, so guess what? He's got it right there for you, and it's ready. You don't have to, you know, get the water out. He's saying, I'll give it to you. Here it is. Just take a drink, one step. Today is the day of salvation. All of these aspects of salvation are super important in understanding the whole picture. Why does everyone say, hey, you know, I, you know I'm being saved? Or why do people say this? I'm working on it. Because they believe they are being saved. They believe it's a process. Because they don't understand there's only one condition. They don't understand that salvation is immediate. It's instantaneous. There is a day of salvation. And praise God that when you go to somebody's door, you can tell them, hey, today is the day of salvation. Amen. I've told people that tons of times. Today is the day of salvation. I've turned people to 2 Corinthians 6 and said, hey, you can be saved today. Better than that, you can be born again right now. Here's the gift. Just take a drink of it. It's one condition. Fulfill it. And it's done. I mean, you, you can be... Think about this. You can become numb to this. And, and I realize that once you hear certain things over and over again, you forget about it. And it's hard to apply it to your own salvation. But think about this diligently. At the moment that you believed personally and you were saved, at that moment, you were passed from death unto life. Your soul was dangling over the flames of hell. And then all of a sudden you're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Amen. Immediately. It, that was the day of your salvation. Go to, go to let's end here. I, was, I didn't have this in my sermon. Go to Revelation uh, chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. So we started off of all the verses you know, that said that we are saved. Are saved. We saw that over and over again, right? Are saved. Look at uh, <clears throat> this is what made me think of that because I said, you know, we're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. It's already a done deal. I'm sealed into the day of redemption. That's why the Bible speaks that way. It's the earnest of my inheritance. I'm already there. That's I already have those things in Him. I'm already sec I'm secure in Christ eternally. I'm already saved. Notice what it says in Revelation 21. Notice the wording. Revelation 21, verse 24. It says this, And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. When it's speaking now about the time when they're in heaven, do you know what words it uses? The nations which are saved. It's the same wording that's used that Paul uses when he's writing to those that are saved. When, that Paul uses when he talks about, for by grace are you saved. It's the same exact wording. And then he speaks about them just in general. The nations of them which are saved, those that are saved, shall walk in the light of it. Because it's already a done deal. They're already saved at the moment that they were saved. Those that were saved at this time when John wrote this, they will walk in the light of it. Because it's, it's done. They've already passed from death unto life. That's why it says that we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Because it's a done deal. Once you step through that door, it's interesting too because I, I actually thought of this for the first time we read that in John 10, 9. 
You know, people will talk about how they'll try to, you know, rebut your, your uh, use of John 10, 28, where Jesus says, you know, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. He says, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Right? And they're like, well, you can, you know, you can get yourself out. But I notice in John 10, 9, he says, you know, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. And then he says this, it's interesting. And he shall go in and out and find pasture. It's like, notice they go out of the door and they're like finding pasture, but guess what? They're still saved. They, they're still saved, even at that moment. Because once you go through that door, it happens at a moment. There's nothing else you need to do. You're saved eternally. You're sealed. It's past tense. And that's why he uses analogies. To, to, to convey the idea and to help you to understand that salvation is immediate. Thank God that salvation is immediate and it's done and it's over. And now today I can look back and I can say I'm not worried about it. Amen. I have zero worry about my salvation. How, how worried are you that you're going to go to heaven? Not at all. Amen. Not even a tiny bit. Right. You know, I may worry about things when I go to sleep at night sometimes. But it's not whether or not I'm, I'm going to wake up in hell. I, 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 you know, since the time that I've been saved, I can't recall a single time where I've ever had a doubt about it right before I went to bed at night. Of course, sometimes you waver in things. You're like, oh, you know, you'll, you'll concern yourself about stuff like that for a couple seconds. You know, then you get regrounded and you put your faith in the Word of God. You remind yourself, hey, I know I'm saved because Amen. of this. Amen. I might worry sometimes about things before I go to bed at night. You know, whether or not my boss is going to be happy with something or whatever it is. You know, whatever. You, you, you just have your own concerns about things. But I'll tell you something I don't worry about. Going to hell. Amen. I'm, you know why? Because it was the day of my salvation. And it was instantaneous and I'm born again. And I can say I am saved. Past tense. Amen. Salvation is not a process. I am not being saved. I am saved. Amen. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for salvation. We 